six. Light, a blurred kaleidoscope of color and sound, a radio with the battery run down. No, people, people speaking, calling, calling his name. What was it? Ah, uh, ah, Matt, Matt. A face swam into focus a few inches away. It was smiling. Why did people smile? It was such an idiotic thing to do, stretching their mouths sideways like that. It didn't mean anything. You could smile when you were happy, and you could smile when you were unhappy. It was also pointless. Didn't show what you were really feeling. No, that would never do, would it? Against the rules. He recognised that face. Someone he knew. Someone he liked. His father. That's who it was. Good for Dad. Always there when he was wanted. There was no need for him to shout, though. That was terribly thoughtless of him. Didn't he realise how much his head hurt? He raised his arm and gently pushed him away. That was better. Now, what was he saying? Hello? He must think of some witty reply. Hello yourself, he replied wittily. Adam was looking worried. What happened? He was saying. Have you any idea what happened? Matthew slowly eased himself up into a sitting position. He was in bed, he discovered. In his own bedroom. How had he got there? He didn't remember going to bed at all. And what day was it? If only his head would stop throbbing for a moment. Matt, this is important. Try to remember. How did you come to be outside? Outside where? Someone else appeared by the side of the bed. A portly, rubicund man with grey hair who also looked worried. This is Dr. Lyle, Matt, said Adam. He helped me carry you in. He needs to know what happened to you. Matthew searched his memory, but found it empty. Carried me in, he said blankly. The doctor bent down, produced a pencil torch and flashed it in Matthew's eyes. Watch this, will you, Matthew? He moved the torch slowly from right to left. Follow it all away. Matthew did as he was told, even though the process started his head throbbing again. That's it, now all the way back. Good. Lyle straightened up, put the torch back in his pocket and turned to Adam. I don't think there's any permanent damage. I'll call back in the morning just to make sure. Thank you, Doctor. Adam moved to the foot of the bed. I don't understand what he was doing there anyway. He should have been in bed. Lyle contemplated Matthew gravely for a moment. You still don't remember, young man? Matthew put his fingers to his temples and tried to concentrate. He'd been in this room when something had landed on his desk. The pebble. The bicycle drawing. Die. I heard someone calling, he said slowly. So I went outside. He stopped, his memory starting to shimmer back. Yes, go on. Adam leaned anxiously over the bed rail. I, I heard this chanting sound in, in the distance from the other side of the village. So I ran and I, I saw these people standing in a circle and, and chanting. Then someone pulled me against one of the stones and I, I felt this, this terrible pain. Like an electric shock? Yes. And then? I, I don't remember. I, I don't remember anything else. Lyle picked up a black bag, set it on the bed and opened it. It's important he gets a good night's sleep, he said producing a bottle of pills. See that he takes two of these, will you? Right. Adam put the bottle in his pocket. Lyle closed his bag and moved toward the door, then turned back, frowning. You've had a nasty bump on the head, Matthew. We really should try and find out how you came by it. Matthew shrugged. Sorry, I can't help. Your father found you on the doorstep outside. Did you fall? I told you, Doctor, all I remember is touching that stone. 
Well, not to worry. Just try and relax, and if you'll take my advice, you won't go wandering about in the middle of the night again. Next time it might be something worse than concussion. Adam followed him to the door. Thanks for your help. Not at all. Tell you the truth, I'm glad of the exercise. These villagers are so damned healthy, I never get a call. I came here in semi-retirement after my heart attack, but I didn't expect to be totally ignored. Matthew suddenly noticed a blood-soaked handkerchief lying on the bedside table. He picked it up and stared at it curiously. What's this? You were wearing it when I found you, said Adam. Someone had banged your head, but I don't understand why he didn't wait. Whoever it was, he might have been able to give us some answers. The two men went out. Matthew lay back on the pillows, inspecting the handkerchief so someone had tended his wound and carried him back to the cottage. But why they left him on the doorstep? It was all too confusing. No use puzzling over it now. Thinking made his head hurt. He'd work it out in the morning. He closed his eyes and drifted off to sleep. Next day, as Matthew was coming slowly down the stairs for breakfast, he heard voices in the sitting room his father's and that of another man. But when he opened the door, he was surprised to find Adam alone. He was leaning out of the window, calling to somebody outside. Who were you talking to? Adam closed the window and moved back to the breakfast table. Some man wanted to know how you were. What did he look like? Like he needed a bath. Said he was a friend of yours. Die. Who's die? Or poacher. Providing you with illicit rabbit, is he? How's the head? Matthew felt the large bump on the back of his skull. Okay, I think. Hungry? (sighs) Starving. Yes, sounds like you're back to normal. Adam turned back, called into the kitchen. Mrs Crabtree? She appeared in the doorway. The invalid would like some breakfast. She gazed at Matthew, full of motherly concern. Oh, poor dear. How do you feel? Matthew stared back at her. It was hard to believe that this was the same woman whose ecstatic face he had picked out from the rest of the villagers the night before. Matt, said Adam sharply, Mrs Crabtree asked you how you felt this morning. All right, thanks. Bit of a headache. Well, I'm not surprised. It's hard stuff, stone. What stone? The doorstep. That's where you fell, wasn't it? Was it? Matthew couldn't keep the hostility out of his voice. There was an uncomfortable silence. Mrs Crabtree wiped her hands on her apron, looking nervous. Well, what would you like then? Some nice scrambled eggs? Yes, anything. She bustled back into the kitchen and Matthew took his place at the table. Adam looked at him coldly. That wasn't very polite. Matthew lowered his voice. She was there, Dad, last night. She was part of that circle I was telling you about. Adam took a mouthful of toast. You sure you didn't dream all that? You found me outside, didn't you? You didn't dream that. You could have sleepwalked. Dad, it all happened. Up to the time I blacked out. It all happened just as I said. Well, I shouldn't let it upset you. What you saw was probably some traditional local ceremony. A lot of these villages have ancient rites and customs they perpetuate, even though their origins may be totally forgotten. Matthew leaned toward him speaking in an urgent whisper. You don't understand. It wasn't just a Morris dance or a village sing-song. The people in that circle looked as if they were, I don't know, possessed. Adam stopped munching for a moment. And where did all this take place? Outside some big house on the other side of the village. Could you find it again? I think so. There was a tap on the door and Dr. Lyle poked his head inside. Morning. 
Morning, Doctor, said Adam. Come in. Lyle entered and set down his bag. Well, how's my one and only patient? No after effects, I hope. Matthew grinned. Not so far. Well, let's have a look at you. The doctor crossed over to him, looked closely into his eyes and examined his head wound. Not falling over or bumping into things? No more than usual. Hmm. Well, I should take it easy for a bit. Don't worry, said Adam. I'll keep him tranquilized. Oh, I don't think that'll be necessary. When I was his age, I was always grateful for a few days off school. School? Sandra, Kevin, and Jimmo. Matthew knew he had to talk to them, to find out if any of them had had a similar experience. And there were other questions. Questions which couldn't wait a few days. The answers were too important. He stood up, dashed across the room to collect his satchel from the peg by the door, and rushed out. The two men looked at each other in amazement. Things seem to have changed since you were a boy, said Adam dryly. Incredible. Lyle shook his head in disbelief. That anyone could be that keen. Yes, said Adam thoughtfully. I've never known him to miss breakfast before. Matthew waited for Sandra in the corridor outside the classroom. Bob passed with a group of high table children wishing him happy day. Matthew didn't reply for some reason which he couldn't explain. He regarded everyone who had taken part in the previous night's ceremony as his enemy. And when one was surrounded by enemies, one had to choose one's friends carefully. Sandra appeared, her dark eyes refreshingly solemn. He grabbed her arm and dragged her away down the corridor so they couldn't be overheard. Ow, she said. You're hurting my arm. I'm sorry, but I want to ask you something. You remember when we first met, you said new people in the village had to stick together? Yes, what did you mean? I meant it was safer. Why? She stared down the corridor toward the classroom. We have to protect ourselves. Protect ourselves from what? I don't know really, it's just something I feel. Matthew thought for a moment. And my first day at school, you told Kevin I must be human, because I'd only just arrived. That's right. So, after people had been here a while, they aren't human anymore, like most of those kids in there. The dark eyes clouded. Yes, she said slowly. Something seems to happen to them. I don't know what it is, but something seems to happen. They change. You must have noticed, some of us are normal, and the rest are... happy ones. They don't look very happy to me. I know. They never lose their tempers, always do as they're told, but they're like... She hesitated, searching for the word. Zombies? suggested Matthew. Yes, zombies, robots, puppets. She looked around, saw that they were alone, and began to look uneasy. We'd better go in. She tried to move past him, but he barred her way. There's a man called Di. The poacher? Yes, you know him? Sort of. I think he's potty, always trying to warn me, telling me to be careful. He told me if I ever needed sanctuary, I should go to him for help. No, no, she shook her head emphatically. If we ever need help, we should go to the sanctuary. Where's that? Linnet Barrow. Di lives there. How far is it? Not far, at the end of the avenue. Matthew tried to remember exactly what the old man had said about where he went. Never beyond the sight of the stones. Never out of their grasp. A strange choice of words. So he does live outside the circle, he said, trying to make sense of it all. Yes, Sandra seemed to read his thought. But still, within the stones... She turned and hurried off down the corridor. Matthew followed her into the classroom. 
Adam stood staring out of the cottage window while Mrs. Crabtree cleared away the breakfast things. The question was, had Matthew received his bump on the head after seeing the chanting circle of villagers, or before? If the latter, then the whole business could be dismissed as hallucination, but even that didn't explain what he was doing on the doorstep in his pyjamas and robe with a dirty handkerchief tied around his head. Matthew's poacher friend, what was his name? Di, had seemed to know something about the affair. Perhaps it was he who bound his wound. The handkerchief was so dirty, it could well have come from a pocket of that scruffy coat. But then, why hadn't he waited? And why had he dashed off so quickly after making sure the patient was all right? Could he have had something to hide? Matthew had said Mrs. Crabtree had been part of the circle. Well, there was a very easy way to find out whether his story was fact or fiction. Mrs. Crabtree, he said, turning toward her. Forgive the impertinence, but do you mind telling me what you were doing last night? Doing, sir? She looked flustered. You mean before I went to bed? That's right. Why, I I was over at Mr. Hendrick's house. Uh, He had one of his little get-togethers. Did you sing, dance? Oh, yes, sir. You can't have a proper celebration without singing and dancing, now can you? So that was it. An innocent country dance which Matthew had mistaken for some kind of sinister ritual. Probably influenced by that blasted picture of his. It looked so like Milbury, that an ordinary village ceremony might well assume a nightmarish aspect in the mind of an impressionable boy. Adam wondered what Margaret would make of the picture, and how it compared with the various charts in the museum. He decided to drop in with it on his way out of the circle. It would be interesting to get an archaeologist's opinion. He went up to Matthew's bedroom, took the picture off the wall and returned just as Mrs. Crabtree was disappearing into the kitchen with the breakfast tray. Oh, by the way, Mrs. C, he said, picking up his magnetometer, what happens about telegrams? Does one have to collect them from the post office? Oh, no need for that, sir. Mrs. Warner delivers them personally. I see. You're expecting one, then? Today? Yes, if it comes while I'm out, sign for it, would you? Of course, sir. Adam strapped the aluminium magnetometer case over his shoulder and, carrying the picture under his arm, set off for the museum. It was a glorious day in the village basked sleepily in the midsummer sun. No, this place was a dream, not a nightmare. As far removed from the horror of the picture as the hallelujah chorus was from a funeral dirge. Nevertheless... Margaret was taken aback when he showed her the painting. Extraordinary, she said, studying it intently. Quite extraordinary. Could it be Milbury? asked Adam, as a primitive settlement. It's certainly possible. She carried the picture over to the display model of the circle as it was in Neolithic times. Yes, there's an uncanny resemblance. The stones are in the same positions and there's the hill. She propped the painting up on the glass case and stepped back, comparing it with the model. There are fewer stones in the picture, of course. It looks like the circle as it is today. There's the avenue leading to the sanctuary, the head of the solar serpent. I'd say it was definitely Milbury. Adam moved to stand by her side. So he said thoughtfully. If the subject's real, it's likely that the story it tells has some real significance. A brilliant source of light that seems to have the power to turn people to stone, a man and a boy escaping toward the sanctuary, fear and terror, ancient and primordial, but what does it all mean? Margaret shivered. Some pagan superstition, perhaps, beginning as a ritual and ending with all the worshippers being... Transformed? It was terrifying. She moved away. We're lucky to be living in this century. 
It's so different. Adam looked around at the various maps and charts pinned to the walls. There's still a lot going on that we don't understand. She sat down at her desk. You mean, like a whole village that suddenly disappears? Oh, I've solved that mystery. They were over at Hendrick's house. He had some sort of party. To which everyone was invited but us? Perhaps we haven't been here long enough. According to Matthew, they were doing some sort of circular dance. Sounded pretty complicated. Margaret stared at him. He saw them. Yes. He told her about Matthew's nocturnal adventure, of his puzzling accident, and of the anonymous benefactor who had bandaged his head. She listened with growing concern. And how is he this morning? Right as rain. I tried to persuade him to take the day off, but he wasn't having any. Insisted on going to school. Not like Sandra. She'd have stayed away for weeks. She finds it tough going? Very. Uh, So does Matt. Even the math, which is odd. He's never had any difficulty before. Margaret picked up a pencil and started doodling on her notepad. A ring of people holding hands, eh? I didn't know they did that here. Did what? It's known as clipping the church. The parishioners clasp hands and move around it in a clockwise direction. With the sun. Then advance and retreat three times. It's an old custom, something to do with renewing one's faith by binding bodies and souls together. Adam frowned. But they were nowhere near the church. I know, it just doesn't make sense unless... Unless what? Unless Hendrix's house is the next best thing. The church is deconsecrated. It's in the gift of the manor. And hasn't had an incumbent for years. Why not? (laughs) Millbury's too small, I suppose. A congregation of fifty-odd souls wouldn't be an economic proposition. Adam looked at his watch. Well, I... Must do some work. How about shutting up shop for an hour or two and coming out to the circle with me? She brightened. I'd enjoy that. Doesn't look as if I'm going to get any customers this morning, and if anyone asks, I can always say I'm widening my knowledge. She locked up the museum and they walked out to the nearest stone. Adam unpacked his magnetometer, explaining how it worked. It's really very simple he said. This instrument consists of a short magnet with a long, non-magnet pointer at right angles across it, pivoted at the junction. The pointer swings along a circular scale, thus enabling deflections of the short magnet to be measured. Margaret frowned. Thanks, she said dryly. That's clear as mud. He grinned. Sorry, just showing off. He handed her a notebook and pencil. Mind copying down the reading? Just watch the pointer. He switched on the machine and the needle jumped around the dial. She waited a moment to make sure it was steady, then wrote down the degree of variation. There you are, she said, holding out the notebook. But Adam took no notice. He was staring at the dial with a puzzled expression on his face. Incredible he said softly. Incredibly good or incredibly bad? Hang on a minute. He moved the instrument to the other side of the rock. The needle remained stationary. Well? Margaret was becoming impatient. What does it mean? He turned to face her. What do you know about magnetic fields? Teach me, Professor. I know the Earth has one. So do rocks. You've heard of lodestones, primitive compasses? Yes. Well, normally rocks would align with the direction of the Earth's magnetic field at the time that the rock stratum was formed. And this doesn't? No. It aligns with the present magnetic field. Which means... Adam didn't reply. Seeing something lying in the grass a few yards away, he walked over and picked it up. 
It was a rusty horseshoe. Watch, he said, and threw the horseshoe at the rock. There was a loud clang as the iron hit the stone, but the horseshoe, instead of falling back to the ground, stuck to the rock like a limpet. Margaret stared at it incredulously. Stone acting like a magnet? It's not possible. There's only one explanation, said Adam quietly. Some tremendous energy has passed through that rock, and very recently. <laughs>